Well, good morning, Wooddale Church. It is good to be here with all of you today. My name is Drew, along with Asha and the rest of the team. We're going to lead you all in some singing here today. So I want to invite all of you to stand and join us as we move into this time of singing. And we take this time in our service each and every week to sing simply as a way to remind ourselves. It's a way to remind ourselves of the goodness and the faithfulness of a God who loves us, a God who is for us, and a God who has a plan for each and every one of our lives. So we want to invite all of you to join in and sing along with us here this morning. So here we go. Let's sing together.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the same every single day, God. Like your word says, yesterday, today, and always, the character, the nature of who you are never changes. And God, I thank you that you meet us right where we are at. God, you don't ask us to be perfect. You don't ask us to clean up. You just simply want us to come before you and offer you our hearts, offer you our lives. And God, it's because of the incredible sacrifice that you made on our behalf on that cross. And not just in your death, but in your resurrection that we can experience new life. So we thank you and we praise you. God, I pray today that you'd open our hearts, you'd open our minds, that you'd speak to us here today, you'd help us take a step closer towards you and knowing you better. So we pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for singing, everybody. You can take a seat. Amen. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Wooddale. Hey, just take a moment, turn to your neighbor and say, hey, it's spring and it's snowing. <laughs> we, we actually... Um, uh, we haven't been advertising this as much as we should, but we have an Easter egg hunt this morning. The eggs are white, um, so we don't quite know what we're going to do. But hey, welcome. Welcome to Wooddale. My name is Adam Sidler. I serve as one of the pastors here, and it's so good to be together. Thank you for, for joining us here. Uh, I want to point to uh, the connection card. This is in the pew back in front of you. And I want to ask if you would take a moment right now, grab that. Whether you've been coming to Wooddale for 20 years or for 10 minutes, uh, this is a great way that we have to connect with you so that we can walk with you in your journey of finding and then following Jesus. And one of the most important things that we have on this connection card is if you flip it over on the back of it uh, is a place for you to indicate how it is that we can pray for you. This is so, so important, guys, in the life of our church. We have a team of people that are committed to pray over every single one of these requests every week. So you know that if you write this down and you drop it in the offering plate as it comes by here in just a little bit, you know that your prayer will be prayed over. If there's something that you want to praise God about, we would love to celebrate with you about that as well. So write that down. And then, as I mentioned, just put these in the offering plate here in just a minute. So Easter is coming. We have a great week in store for us. Today's Palm Sunday. That moment, that day, and Pastor Kyle talked about this a couple weeks ago, where Jesus, he rides into Jerusalem on the donkey, and the people are, are yelling, they're, they're, they're proclaiming, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And then we reflect on the fact that a week later, those same people were screaming, crucify him. And as Jesus willingly gave his life for you and for me as a ransom for our sin, taking on the penalty that we so rightly deserved, we reflect on that. We remember what it took for us to be free. So we're going to do that on Good Friday. We have a Good Friday service. It's going to be fantastic, guys. Last year, it was my first Good Friday service here at Wooddale Church, and I told Pastor Dave after the service, I said, Pastor, um, man, that was the best Good Friday service I had ever been a part of. You're not going to want to miss it. What an amazing time it is. It's going to be to reflect and to remember the sacrifice that Christ became. But then he didn't remain in the grave. Can I get an Amen. Easter's coming. And we got four amazing services that you're going to want to be a part of. We got a service on Saturday night, and that's going to be a, a traditional style service. And then we have three services on Sunday morning. You might no notice that the times are a little bit different, so pay attention to that. 8.30 is another traditional service, and then we have two modern services. And here's the deal. We have these cards, these Easter invite cards, and these are on the table as you leave um, the worship center, I believe the ushers are going to be handing these out as well. Take one, five, ten of these. We would love to be able to run out of these so that we have to order more because you guys are getting busy with inviting others to come and to share that time with us. And it's not so that we can pack the seats, but it's so that we can have 
people here to intersect with the truth of the gospel that is Jesus Christ crucified, but then risen from the dead, providing life everlasting. And so this Easter, that may be the day, the moment that forever changes those that come. And all you gotta do is hand this to them and say, come with me, come with me. And I bet they will. So grab these on your way out. We're gonna continue in our time of worship as we remember not only what Jesus Christ did, the life we have in him, but the glory that God deserves. And as we reflect on giving him the very best of what he's given us, not just in our resources, but also with our time, with our talents, let's pray. Father God, thank you for loving us so much that you provided the only way, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I pray, Lord, that today would be yet another moment in which we are challenged by your truth and compelled and inspired to respond. We pray this in your name and all of God's people said, amen.
Good morning, everyone. Um, this, as we were reminded by Adam, is Palm Sunday. And this is when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. And of course, Friday, the people who cheered for him condemned him. What I want to do this morning, though, is I want to talk about some of the things Jesus said between that time, especially in regards to his second coming. And I thought it was really appropriate that here in Minnesota, at least, we would be talking about that today since we are preparing for Snowmageddon and uh, all that goes uh, with that. So I'm glad for many of you that came and those who are joining us online or our campuses as well. But I want to talk about the second coming of Christ with you in uh, Mark chapter 13. If you're going to use the Pew Bible to follow us, it's page 1547, 1547, you're welcome to do that. But uh, I was wondering to myself, how do, how do uh, Americans feel about the second coming of Jesus statistically? And I found a couple of numbers. For instance, I found that 55, 55% uh, of Americans uh, believe that, um, that Jesus will probably come in their lifetime. And I was, I was pleasantly surprised by that. And then uh, Pew Research said that 41% of Americans believe that Jesus will have arrived by the year 2050. So my question to you is, what do you think? When do you think the Lord is going to return? That's a big question, isn't it? And you can find the answers to that on the internet. Um, and uh, <laughs> we all know that whatever you find on the internet is true. But uh, anyway, uh, getting back to what we're going to talk about today, Jesus and his disciples were leaving the, the Temple Mount, the Temple Complex. And uh, as they were leaving, um, they mentioned to Jesus how grand and glorious the Temple and the Temple Mount was, and wasn't it impressive? If you, had, uh, if you could go with me today and, and visit uh, Israel, and we were to stand on the Mount of Olives and look across at the the Temple Mount, this is what you would see. It's kind of what it looks like today. Uh, the Dome of the Rock on top there, and of course that's Muslim, and then uh, this whole region here and the walls underneath, and down here you have the walls um, all the way, and the pavement all the way to Jesus' day. And, uh, but if you were to go there and uh, uh, back in time and see what Jesus and the disciples saw, this is what you would, you would discover. Uh, it's a replica uh, based on what we know from history of what it looked like. And it was indeed grand. It was indeed very glorious. It was very beautiful. And so you, you can sense their pride. You know, this, this, amazing, this amazing building. But watch what happens. Mark chapter 13, verse 1. It says, As Jesus was leaving the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at the impressive stones in the walls. Jesus replied, yes, look at these great buildings, but they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple, and Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him privately and asked him, tell us, when will this happen? What sign will you show us that these things are about <clears throat> to be fulfilled. Now, when Jesus says it's all going to come tumbling down, it was, it was a shocker to these guys. And you would have been shocked as well. This, this thing was enormous. For instance, the largest stone that we know of, which you can see when you're in the, in the tunnels that go next to the wall, is 44 feet long, 15 feet wide and 10 feet high as one stone. So it's marvelous without mechanical, you know, kinds of things that they were able to move and put it in place. It weighs 570 tons. That is more than a fully loaded 747 jet. And there were thousands of stones that went into it and then the, the temple complex itself that you saw on the top of all that. So it just boggled their mind to think that all of that could actually come tumbling down. Let's continue reading in um, Mark chapter 13, verse 24. It says, but in those days, Jesus said, following that distress, 
The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, look at this, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. When I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Now, Mark chapter 13 and... Matthew's account and Luke's account of what this is called the Olivet Discourse has been confusing for a lot of people because you have to remember when Jesus gives this, it's in answer to, his, to the, questions of, or the question of his disciples, when will the temple come tumbling down? And we know from history that it happened 30-some years later in 70 A.D., when the future emperor of Rome, General Titus, came with his armies and ransacked Jerusalem and toppled the temple over and devastated it. So when you think about that, it leaves you kind of thinking, well, are all these words like in the past? Is it just for them? It's already taken place. Is there nothing really left for us? Is that how we're supposed to think about it? And the answer is, well, yes, it was meant for them. It, he did answer the question. The temple was destroyed. But there's plenty here for you and for me. Because what we have here is a foreshadowing of the end of time. What we have here is a foreshadowing of what is going to happen when Christ returns. And the judgment that took place on Jerusalem is a foreshadowing of the judgment that's going to happen on this earth to this country and every country on earth the earth as a result of that. And that's why people, when it comes to the second coming of Christ, you know, they either become fearful or, or they become frustrated. I remember when I was a kid, uh, that's when uh, these movies came out, the Billy Graham Association produced them about the rapture, right? One of them, was, I think it was called like, the, like Distant Thunder. I don't even remember the movie. You're old enough to remember that, okay? I used to sit in the service and watch that and just be petrified. Afraid that Jesus was going to come back and I'd be the one on the jet that didn't go up. And the pilot did. And you know how that all, all goes, right? It was, it was terrifying to me. A lot of people, you know, they, they'll talk about it, but, they, but they're fearful about it. I don't, I don't blame them when you read the, the words like in Revelation. And other people are just frustrated. Because, you know, there's so much debate about the timing and when and where and how. And, and the result is people just say, you know, that's, that's, for, that's for scholars, that's for preachers, that's for prophecy geeks. I'm just going to live my life. And they kind of live their life head down, right? Just kind of going through life like this. And Jesus says, he says, I'm warning you, don't do that. When you, when, when you heard those words I was reading from Mark chapter 13 or you read it in your own Bible, did you see how often Jesus says, watch, watch out, don't fall asleep at the wheel, so to speak, stay alert. Be alert anytime. Watch. And that's meant for, for every generation. It's, it's meant for you and it's meant for me. And the question is, well, why? Why should I always be watchful for the second coming of Christ? And here's the big idea, okay? Anticipating and looking forward to the return of Christ is one of the most important ways that you and I can overcome the threats and temptations of this world. Because you and I live in a world that's chaotic at best and, and 
you know, we face all kinds of threats and there's all kinds of temptations. And it's, it's just getting so weird, right? And, and how, do you, how do you get through that? How do our young people get through that? How do you and I get through that? How do parents get through that? How do we navigate this crazy world? Well, Jesus says being focused on the second coming is going to help you do that. Now, I know if you were aware I was going to talk about this or you came in and just heard me say I'm, I'm talking about second coming, some of you are in the back of your mind going, oh, no. I hope he doesn't bring out charts and timelines and predictions. And some of you are like, oh, yes. I hope there are charts and timelines. And I hope he makes some prediction about when he thinks Jesus is coming. Well, I have, I have bad news and good news. The bad news is, I, depending on how you take it, is I don't have charts and I don't have timelines. But I do have a couple predictions. Some of you are excited about that. Some of you are very nervous about that. And I'll share those predictions, though, in just a couple of minutes, all right? Because what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit more about this attitude toward the Lord's coming. You know, people are good with our, our Lord's first coming. Have you ever noticed that? He comes like a little lamb, like a, like a baby. He's born in the manger. He's sweet. He's cuddly. It's, it's got a warm, fuzzy feel to it, right? We, got, we get excited about Christmas, especially when it's snowing like it is here in Minnesota right now. Be like going home, putting the Christmas tree up because we really haven't had much snow. And, uh, you know, we get the manger scene out, and we place the, you know, all the artifacts in there, and, and we think about the baby and the manger. We think about Mary. We think about Mary holding her baby, Joseph standing there. We think about the shepherds kneeling there and worshiping, and, we, and you know, there's kind of a glow in there, if you ever noticed that. And then right above it is that amazing star that's just twinkling there. It's just beautiful. And that's comfortable. That, that's, we like that coming. But I'm telling you what. If you look at the second coming of Jesus, he does not come as a lamb, he comes as a lion. He doesn't come as a baby, he comes as a king and as a warrior, and he's bringing judgment. And the stars fall out of the sky, they're not in the sky, if you read those words carefully. And it's intimidating to people, it's, it's overwhelming for people when they, when they read those kinds of words. And they hear those kinds of things that are, that are being said. I've been journeying through the book of Revelation and uh, this last month or so and, and just having my devotions there. And I came across this passage which just kind of raises that intimidation. Listen to what it says in Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. John says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. That's Jesus. With justice he judges and wages war. That's a lion, that's not a lamb, that's a warrior. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. It means he has all authority. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword, with which to strike down the nations, that's his word. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And some people have a hard time with that. In fact, it's interesting, like I said, I've been reading through Revelation. In Revelation chapter 9, read it later. In chapter 16, read it later. Twice in both chapters, we find out that God is pouring out his judgment on the world. And the response by so many is they refuse, it says, to repent. They refuse to say they're sorry. They refuse to turn towards God. What they do is they, they raise their fist toward God. They're angry that God is ruining their lives and ruining the world that they wanted to have. And you know, years ago I would read that and I just could not imagine that people would have such an attitude and such, such a, a spirit like that towards God. But as I watch the world, as I see what's happening around us, it's not hard for me to imagine anymore. There are, just, there are some people who just hate God. They don't want anything to do with God. They don't like what what God wants and what, what God is, is all about as a result of that. And so, you know, the temptation is then to just say God doesn't exist. That's one way to deal with it, denial. Or to just kind of reduce Jesus down to a guru who, you know, it's, it's, it, 
he's really just a, a glorified man, you know, some special spirit in him. And that all this language is just symbolic. It's, it's, not, it's not real. It's not real. But look what he says. Jesus says, at that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. So what Jesus is saying is, look, this isn't symbolic. This is real. It is visible. It is historical. It's actually going to happen. You know, in the New Testament, there are about 300 verses that refer to prophecy, that refer to the coming of Christ. That's like one out of every 13 verses. So the Bible says a lot about the second coming. And, and we shouldn't ignore it. We should, you know, we should pay attention to it. Because it's put there to make a difference in our life, here and now. Say, so well, what, what difference does thinking a lot about the second coming of Jesus make? I'm glad you asked that question. Because here's the first one. It will change how you view the problems that plague our society today. It's going to change how you view what's happening in the world around you today. And we need the change that it brings. Did you notice the passage of Scripture? It says that he's coming. He's coming with the clouds. It doesn't say on the clouds or through the clouds. He's coming with the clouds. What does that mean? What's that all about? But if you really start to think about it, it has significant meaning for you and for me. Let me take you back to the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, 2, and then up until Adam and Eve rebel in chapter 3, God's presence was with his people, Adam and Eve. And God's intention is that he would always be present as the earth became populated. He would be present with his creation. It's like God said... I, I love my creation so much, I'm actually going to come and make earth my headquarters. I'm going to be right with my creation. It was wonderful. It was paradise. And then Adam and Eve rebelled and sinned. And what happened is that God had to withdraw his presence. How do you like Lord of the Rings trilogy? I, I try to watch it every year. I enjoy it a lot, J.R. Tolkien. I love the symbolism of it. Ha, but have you noticed, at least in the three, the three movies, have you noticed that it's, it's filmed in kind of a gray, dark, shadowy kind of atmosphere and, and there's really no color to it at all? Why is that? It's because, as Tolkien says, the ring has bound man together in the shadows, in darkness. And so they carry that theme all the way through until the very end, right? And then at the very end, you know, when it's all over, everything is bright and everything is beautiful and everything is colorful. And so, you know, we kind of we live in a shadow of evil now. It, and it's cast over our world and we feel it. We sense it. We sense the darkness. We sense kind of the gloom that's there. But, you know, God... It, at different times, has, has pierced the shadows. He's pierced the darkness with his, with his presence. Like in Exodus chapter 13. You might want to read that later on. In Exodus chapter 13, when God has his children leave Egypt and they go through the Red Sea and out into the wilderness, it tells us in that passage of Scripture that God was with them by day in a what? <clears throat> in a cloud and by night in a pillar of fire. And it says there that he was always with them. But I love the picture of when they build the tabernacle and God comes like right into their midst. And let me just read it for you. It's here in Exodus chapter 40. It says, then the, look, the cloud covered the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Look what it says now. It says, the cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the day. This must have been fantastic. And at night, fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. This continued throughout all their journeys. God's presence, the cloud. And then the cloud, you know, with a fire in it glowing. And then, then we get to the temple in 1 Kings. Look what it says. When the priest came out of the holy place, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priest could not continue their service because of the cloud. For the glorious presence of the Lord Fill the temple of the Lord. What is this cloud? The Hebrews call it the Shekinah of God. And, and the word Shekinah means like the, the dwelling place or, or the glorious presence of God. 
So when, when Jesus says, I'm coming back with the clouds, what he's saying is, I'm bringing the Shekinah with me. And get this, and the Shekinah is going to be with God's children, Jew and Gentile alike, who put their faith in Christ forever and ever and ever. Which then helps us understand a little bit when he says about the fig tree. Look what he said. He said, now learn this lesson for the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Instead of trying to figure out what is the day and time that that's referring to, is it next week or next month or next year, we need to pay attention to something else. How many of you like figs, by the way, besides me? I love figs. Fig Newton bars, fig. I had fig uh, yogurt the other day. It was really good. But you know, figs are a tough tree. We had a fig tree in California. That thing was almost indestructible. But it would always lose its leaves in the wintertime. It's one of the few trees in Israel that will lose its leaves, but it always comes back in the spring in full force and bears that beautiful, those beautiful figs. In other words, you can always count that in the spring, the leaves will return. In essence, what Jesus is saying is, when I come back, I'm bringing an eternal spring that will never end. How many of you like spring? It's a beautiful time of the year, isn't it? Everything comes to life. There's a freshness. There's vitality. It's, it's so good. And Jesus is saying, when I return, I'm bringing that. There's not going to be any more disease, no more cancer, no more worries, no more fear, no more racism, no more injustice, no more politics, no more war, no more violence, no more jealousy. It's all going to be gone. No more. No more. And we just sit there and go, yeah. <sighs> Did you hear what I just said? No more. That's good news, isn't it? No more snow again. <laughs> no more mosquitoes. No more sin. No more violence in this world. Let me ask you a question. And, and it's rhetorical, but just I, I want you I want you to think about this in your heart for a moment. Do you look forward to the Lord's return? A lot of people don't even think about it. Let me ask you this question. Do you grieve when you look at the world around you right now? Because I do. When I, when I see what's happening to our students, when I, when I see what's happening in families, when I see what's happening politically, and, and, and when I see what's happening around the world, and, and, the, and the injustice and all the horrible things that are happening, it grieves my heart. But listen very carefully. What I'm concerned about is that is that I think we're allowing some of that to build into us a bitterness and a hatred and an anger toward the world and toward others. And that's not supposed to happen. The grieving should cause us to want to do something, not become resentful, not become bitter, and not become angry. I told you I, I've been reading through the book of Revelation, and I came across this verse, and I, I read it before, but it meant so much to me this time. He says, and I saw another angel flying through the sky carrying the eternal good news. I love that. The eternal good news. To proclaim to the people who belong to this world, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. That's what we're supposed to be about until Jesus comes. We're supposed to be telling a world living in the shadowlands that there's good news. It might be hard right now, but there's so much to look forward to. And in a sense, we're supposed to be bringing a taste of what is to come in the here and the now. Like people should be getting a feel what heaven's going to be like whenever they're around us and whenever they're in our midst. Does that sound like the church today? Does that sound like how people feel when they're with you? I'm, I'm preaching to myself just as much. See, it's not enough just to talk about this gospel, this good news. We're called to, like, live it and demonstrate it. And I'm, you know, I'm so glad to be part of Wooddale Church because, because you all do such a great job demonstrating it. You know, I was just in Guatemala this week with our bridge builders team. We've been going down there for 35 years, and this was the celebration. They asked me to come down, and Marsha and I went, and I taught about 100 pastors for a day and a half. We had a wonderful time. But I so enjoyed watching individuals and families from our church down there doing what we've been doing for 35 years, and that is building houses. You know, some, some years we do medical care. Our youth have gone down there many, many different times. 
Uh, we put water systems in. We, we uh, pray with people who are infirm and sick. We help start or celebrate recovery. I could go on. And it has such a powerful effect because people aren't just hearing the gospel, they're seeing the gospel. We're doing that in Cuba as well. In other parts of the world, we're doing it right here in our own backyard. Whether it's our coat closet or providing food or the ministries that we support are involved in in Minneapolis or the families we're reaching out into our community. We want to touch 30,000 families by 2032. We're just starting on that. God is at work. And he wants us to show this world there's a better day coming by giving him a taste of it now. That's what we should be focused on, not on what's going wrong with the world, but what can we bring to the world to show them the love of God. Amen? We just see what's happening is Satan is just so, I talked about this last weekend, he's so tricky, so sneaky, he gets us sideways, he gets us off track, and all we can do is obsess and be focused about how rotten the world is and how we wish it was back the way it used to be, as though there's no heaven to come. There's so much to come. Let's give him a taste of what is to come. Amen? Amen. All right, second point. I got a little bit of time left. It will significantly impact your integrity and behavior for the good. For the good. So first, it helps me navigate this crazy world because I know heaven's coming. We're going to get past this. Secondly, it's a real motivator. If I believe that Christ is coming, it motivates me to say, you know, I want to, I want to live for him now. So this is where I have my two predictions, okay? <clears throat> so you can, you can write this down or back online and listen to it. Those of you joining us online, here's my two predictions. First prediction, ready? Jesus is coming back definitely. <laughs> right, that's the first one, okay? Second prediction, nobody knows when he's coming back, not even him. Some of you are like, that wasn't fair. That was so disappointing. I expected more than that. But look what Jesus said. He said, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And I don't know how else to explain this, nor the Son, except to say that in his humanity, Jesus limited himself and did not know that, chose not to know that. I believe he knows it now, but at least then he did not know, nor the Son of Man. Now, I think it's interesting how we can obsess over all kinds of things, like, you know, when is the rapture going to happen? Is it before, during, or after the tribulation? You know, when's the millennium, or is there a millennium? Are we pre, post, or amillennial? Or, you know, we'll argue about how long really is the, the uh, tribulation period, or who is the Antichrist, or what does 666 mean? And like I told you, you can go to the Internet, and there are all kinds of answers to those things. But we obsess about things that Jesus didn't obsess about. What he says I want you to obsess about is not all the details. What I want you to obsess about is the fact that I could return. And I want you to live like I could return in the moment. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but everybody here, unless Christ comes or you're like Moses or Elijah, you're going to die. Did you know that? How are you aware of that? You're going to die. And none of us have the promise that we'll see tomorrow. I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to people who've lost loved ones lately, and Someone just said to me, this person was perfectly healthy. Just today, they said this person was perfectly healthy, and I think it was like in their 40s, and they, and they just dropped over, and they passed away. That could be anybody here. You know, when you're young, you don't think it'll ever happen to you, but it happens to young people. And so we all need to be ready. And so C.S. Lewis, he wrote an essay, um, and, and the essay is called The World's Last Night. And I just want you to listen to what he said. He said, Price, uh, precisely because we cannot predict the moment we must be ready at all times. The sentry does not know at what time the enemy may attack. Or the sentry does not know the time an officer might inspect his post. So he must be awake at all times. Not that we should always be running around in fear that the end might happen at any moment. We should be like an 80-year-old man or woman who needs on the one hand, not to be always thinking about his approaching or her approaching death, but he or she should always be taking it into account. It would be criminally foolish not to have made his or her will, and so on. I have a question for you. 
If you knew that you were going to die, somehow you received the news with certainty you're going to die in 30 days. Which could happen sooner. How would that change your life? What would you stop doing? What would you start doing? Who would you talk to? What would you change? That's a really good question, isn't it? If we all live like that, it could have a dramatic impact on our lives, our marriages, our families, our friends, our existence, our purpose here on this earth. I like to listen to a little audio book with J. Oswald Chambers' Devotions, and, and I also have the, the little book, and uh, I want to read to you something. I, I, I heard it and then read it just a few days ago about death. Ready? He says, what is death? When Jesus grips my soul, death is a mere episode. Death has no sting in it. The saint has a peace as deep as God, as unruffled as God, even in the face of death. Do you understand that the joy of the Lord is your strength, he asks? We are so apt to look at the difficulty of the ways that we are going. But the saint, and saint he means any believer, has God's mighty peace in his or her heart. And he or she sees it and is all right. Do not let your heart be troubled, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. See, when, that, when you have that then, and you really believe he's come here, you could see him tomorrow. It causes you to want to live, as Paul says, in a way that honors and pleases him. I hope that's you. I hope that's me. All right, last, last thought. So it helps me navigate this crazy life. helps me to live the life that's pleasing to God. Number three, it'll impact your ability to forgive and make peace with people who have wronged you. How many of you have ever been wronged? Let me see your hands. All of us have. I will not ask you to raise your hands on this one because I know all of you would have to, including me. How many of you have ever wronged somebody else? We all have, right? We all have. Tim Keller writes about these things, the issues of how we treat each other in, 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 many, in some of his books, some of his sermons. And he says, you know, uh, we, when we're wronged, we all, have an, we all have this thing in us where we want to run and find the big judgment seat, climb up on there and sit on it, and then judge the people who've wronged us or wronged others or who are doing wrong things in the world. Would you agree with that? Okay. I even saw people online nodding, all right? Yes, we can agree with that. We do that, right? It happens to us. He goes on and he says, and we have the uncanny ability to know what they deserve and to help them get it. And some of us would really like to help some people get it, wouldn't we? But he says, he says we can never sit on the judgment seat. Because it doesn't belong to us. It only the Bema seat, the judgment seat, belongs to God. Only he could judge rightly. Only he could judge fairly. Francis Schaeffer had this little thought experiment. He said, what would happen if there was an invisible tape recorder that was hung around all of our necks? And it was triggered to record Whenever we said something to somebody like, you ought to do this or you should do that, you know, like our idea of how people should live, it, it recorded all that. And then you die and you stand before God. And God says to you, you know, I'm not going to judge you by my standards. I'm going to turn that tape recorder on and will judge you by your standards you had for other people. What would happen? we would be in trouble, wouldn't we? If we were judged by the standards we place on others. None of us has that right or that ability. Only God knows everything. We have to leave it in his hands. But see, here's what's so freeing. Here's what's so freeing. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Paul talks about that in Romans. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And he says, so since it's my deal to take care of all the wrongs that have been done, you do good. You do what is right. I'll settle all the accounts, and God has a wonderful memory. So all those wrongs and injustices you've experienced in life, you know what? Just leave it in God's hands. He'll deal with it if they don't repent. 
you just be free to be good and to offer forgiveness to your enemies so they don't have to face that awful judgment. Because on Good Friday, and Pastor Kyle's going to talk about it, and then I'll do the Easter sermon. Because on Good Friday, Jesus took all of our judgment on himself. And God judged his son as though it was you and me and poured out his wrath on his son. And that's why Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you and I could be judgment free. I have never traveled as much as I've been traveling this last year on behalf of you and, and what we're trying to do overseas and trying to fill a, a, a big gap of spiritual formation and talking about character and helping our, our leaders live godly lives. And um, when I land in the various countries and I'm going to the place where I'll teach or speak, if it's daylight, you know, we drive through some pretty rough places in the world. And I look around me and I, and I see people, uh, whether it's in India or Nepal or nations in Africa or Guatemala or other places, and I, don't, I hardly see any smiles. I just see hard looks. I see desperate looks. I see sad looks. The other day when I was in Ghana and, and uh, I was, we were at a place that wasn't a Christian campground, but it was the only place we could get to teach. The workers were, were not believers, and I just looked around, and I just saw no smiles. I saw no joy. As we're driving through the streets, and the women, you know, have these huge baskets. I don't know how they carry it, and their necks don't, you know, break. But there's just, they're sweating. There's harshness. They're, when I'm in India, Nepal, there's desperation. In, Guata, you know, in, in Guatemala, in the city, of people just, it's just, and I wonder what is going on. And I realize the reason there's no smiles is because there's no hope. This is it. This is all I have. Nothing to look forward to. If I didn't have anything to look forward to, I would be the same way. But you and I have so much to look forward to. Either he's coming back while we're living and breathing, or very quickly, we're going to stand before him in paradise. And the ambience of his Shekinah glory. Until he returns or until we go. Could we spread the light? Could we tell people who don't have a smile, who don't have a reason, could we tell them there's a reason? There's a God. And he, he gave his life for you. He took his judgment for you. And there's hope. And you're going to spend eternity with him. Paradise is coming. It will change. That's what we have to look forward to. When people were enslaved in our country, what hope they had. You hear so many of those beautiful spiritual songs. It was all based on what was coming. Because here, there was no hope. And we need to learn something from that. The hope that's coming. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would forgive our sins if, if we've been sidetracked, if we had our head down, if we're living for ourselves, if, if we're acting as though we're not going to die, you're not going to come, we're sorry. We want, we want to be ready to either meet you through death or meet you at your coming. God, thank you that there's hope beyond this world. Thank you so much. Help us not to hate the world, Lord, but to spread the hope in this world. Invite people to come this Easter. Show them God's love in our everyday life. And Lord, if we have built up some bitterness, some hatred, some anger, some harshness toward others, if we're trying to play judge and jury, we, we ask you to forgive us. Help us get past the bitterness, the hurt. We'll, we'll leave it in your hands. And we don't pray for that person to be condemned. We pray for the repentance. We pray they would come to know your releasing grace. Help us, Lord, live in your peace. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What a wonderful message here today. Keep 
your head up. Would you stand as we prepare to close our time together here this morning? How do we, how do we cause the world to lift their head and to gaze upon the Father? How do we do that? If, if you're anywhere and you say, heads up, what's the reaction? Right? Put your head down, right? So that's not going to work. I'll just do a quick little experiment. This section right here, I need you all's cooperation, I want you to lift your head and look up at the ceiling. Now look at them, guys. You feel that, that tension? What do you want to do? You want to look up. That's how we get the world to look up and to see the Father as we look up ourselves. May we do that this week. May we cause the world to be inspired to find and follow Jesus. Thank you for being here today. I want you to be safe as you drive and uh, want you to grab some of those Easter invite cards as well. God bless.